Who wants to join the culture war? Hi. So, this is Kinextras. Oh, my phone's not on me? Oh, see? This is how prepared I am. Hello again. Uh, so this is, uh, I've actually made an outline because I tried to do this without it and it did not work. So I have a pretty simple goal with this video. I'm not out here to tell you you should get rid of your gas stove right now because that's difficult and expensive. I'm also not going to tell you that gas stoves don't have any advantages because they certainly do for certain types of cooking. But I do want to hopefully convince you that even a standard electric stove is fine. And how do I intend to do that? Simple. They are actually faster than a gas stove. Now, this surprised me. You may remember from my uh, kettle video, if you saw that, that uh, I brought this red kettle over to my parents' stove and it was significantly faster at bringing it to a boil than my gas stove. That was surprising to me. Um, so I totally get that this is going to sound like make-believe, but I'm here with some tests to show you that this is indeed the case. Now, caveat, they are slower in that particular way that I know the people who have used both electric and gas and strongly prefer gas are going to say, and I will give you that. But counterpoint, induction stoves are a thing, and if you haven't used one, you should give it a try. But I didn't get an induction stove. I will go into reasons why later. So before we get into the tests, I do want to give a little bit of backstory. Feel free to skip to this time marker if you don't care. Um, Basically, I've had the little nugget in my head that gas stoves are probably not the best thing to have in your home because of air pollution concerns. I've had it in my head for a while. Um, this latest culture war nonsense, I don't know why exactly it flared up uh, right this minute, but um, we've had, like I said, my kettle video. I made that seven months ago, and in that script I said there's increasing evidence that gas stoves are not great for indoor air quality. And actually, there's been information out since the 80s about this. Um, this is not new information, it's just coming to light now. So I've been toying with the idea of replacing the stove here because this, uh, this building is stupidly sealed up. Just me and the cat being here brings baseline CO2 levels to about 750 to 800 parts per million. And um, that's just me. I mean, the cat's some of it, but it's basically just my body, me existing. There's so little air exchange between inside and outside that CO2 concentration basically doubles when I'm here. So that has been a little bit concerning to me, but I haven't made the jump because I too thought, well, gas stoves are better than electric stoves and I'll just open the windows or run bathroom fans. I actually installed... Um, bathroom fans timer switches so I can run them for an hour and I was getting in the habit of turning them on every time I use the stove. But what finally pushed me to just get rid of it was over Christmas I was staying at my parents home and again they have a radiant cooktop. And I've used it several times but it hasn't it's it's not been years since I really lived with it for any length of time and um lately I have been getting in the habit of having cream of wheat for breakfast. I'm a very old soul, if you can't tell. Um, and cream of wheat is, it's a type of porridge. You might know it as farina, F-A-R-I-N-A. And um, you boil water or milk and then add the stuff and simmer it for a while. And with an electric stove, um, a conventional stove, you have to be careful when you're boiling things because you can overshoot that target. But I've remembered how to use an electric stove, so I successfully, without boiling it over, made cream of wheat. And earlier I had made rice on the stove, because they don't have a rice cooker. And uh, actually that's a lie, they don't have a small one, I was just making it for myself. And same thing, didn't have an issue boiling over because I remembered, just turn the heat down before it gets to a boil. So the knowledge of how to use an electric stove has not left my brain. and. It, the Both of those processes went surprisingly quickly. It seemed to me like it got to a boil earlier than I was expecting in both cases. And so I finally thought, why don't I just bite the bullet? Here, uh, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. You can kind of just do whatever you want. And I have 200 amp electrical service and room for another breaker. And the stove happens to be right above the area that the breaker box is in. So adding a new circuit for it was very straightforward. It took me about three hours. And again, to acknowledge that is special. It's 
uh, special for me, that I'm comfortable doing that, that I'm able to do that, and that I have the electrical supply to do it. So I'm not trying to say anybody can do this easily. I'm lucky in that regard. But I had the means to run a new circuit easily, just buy a stove, have it delivered, and then plug it in. Because an electric stove, you basically just plug it in. So I took out, or I unhooked the gas stove, capped off the gas line, and have a new stove now. Uh, so that's where we are. <laughs> So the particular stove that I chose is a fairly high-end stove. It is one of the ones that has a double oven. So rather than have a storage drawer below the oven, right, should clarify, uh, for any European viewers who may be watching, it is pretty uncommon in the US to have a separate oven and cooktop. It is usually one device, which we call a range, although range is more of a technical term. I never call it that. I just call it the stove. So here, normally, unless it's generally pretty high-end kitchen layouts that have a separate stovetop and oven. So it's just a regular range. And the feature that I really wanted, because I've, I've grown to really like this, is these double oven ranges. So rather than have a storage drawer below the oven, which is quite typical, the old one had it, they use that space for a second oven. But, and this is why I really wanted it, they flip it. So there's an oven at the top, which is very narrow and skinny, and then a big oven down below for doing your turkey or whatever. Mainly, I just want that skinny oven at the top because it's a more convenient height to use and uh, I don't need a full oven almost ever. So that's a feature that was priority for me. And to get that with an induction cooktop was ridiculous. It pretty much doubled the cost of the stove, which again is ridiculous because induction cooking technology is not new. It's not that expensive, but market situations make it what it is. So. That is the main reason why I do not have an induction stove. I have some other reasons, which I'll explain later, but with all this pontificating, let's just get to the tests. So before I got rid of the gas range, I decided to boil different quantities of water in various pieces of cookware that I have and time how long it takes to get to a boil. Now, I did not do this the most scientific way. I never, again, I don't know why I keep not doing this, but I didn't measure the beginning water temperature. However, I did run the tap long enough so that way it was coming from the pipes underground, so it was really cold. So it should be a very similar starting temp. But uh, I just wanted to see how long it takes to get from cold to a roaring boil. Now I know that that's not the most perfect test. There's more things that you do with a stove, but what that is going to show is how quickly the stove can get energy into cookware, which is the entire reason it exists. The whole point of a stove is to get heat energy into cookware and thus into food. So I think it's about the most fair test that you can do. So again, before I got rid of the stove, I took various pieces of cookware and tested how long they took to boil. Okay, we're back at this nonsense again. I want to see how quickly this gas stove can bring four quarts of water to a boil. And I'm going to actually film this. I've done some other tests, but I know people will probably want to see one actually occur, so I will do that. And I'm also going to let you know what indoor CO2 levels do throughout this test. Ah, CO2 levels. Let me just explain that the CO2 is not my biggest concern. Arguably, you shouldn't be in a space that's above a thousand parts per million for any length of time, and I intend at some point to get some better ventilation going on here. But I'm using the CO2 as a proxy for the other emissions coming from the stove. So the biggest things of concern are NO2 and uh, there might be other nitrous oxides, but I keep hearing people just say NO2, and particulate matter, the fine particulate matter from the combustion. And uh, I do know cooking in general produces particulate matter, um, but why not get rid of the kind from the stove? So anyway, CO2 is just being used as a proxy for that. I know it's not really that harmful on it by itself, but when CO2 goes up quite a lot because of using the stove, then we know that those worst things are also in the air. And it just gives a good idea of how hard it is to get that ex um, to get all that stuff out of the living space. And if I didn't mention it in the testing, because it's been too long since I did it, uh, I do have an over-the-range vent hood microwave, which does vent outside, but the run of piping is awful. So it basically doesn't do much. 
Uh, so yes, anyway, moving on. Right now, CO2 is at about 800 ppm, the last time I looked at the meter. Uh, I'm gonna start the test and I will turn on the extractor. It's an over the range microwave. It is vented outside, but it doesn't work that well, as you'll see. Um, but yeah, without further ado, let me turn on the vent. That's on high. And we will start the test. Okay, let me actually look at the meter and tell you what it says right now. It is reading 818, 818 parts per million. I expect this is gonna take somewhere around 16 minutes to come to a boil. That is what it took on this burner with a differently shaped pot. It had a wider base uh, than this one but I want to do this pot on the same burner as well. So what was it? Let me see. It took 16 minutes and 30 seconds on the same burner with a different pot. Now, when I ran that test, I used this pot on the back left burner, the one that the uh, kettle is on top of right now. That is also listed as a quick boil burner, but it is nowhere near as fast as this one. That actually took over a half hour to bring four cups of water to a boil. And uh, this is the stove. This is the pot that was on that burner. So, yeah, uh, this idea that gas stoves are really fast is increasingly sounding like BS to me. Uh, but that's that's uh, that's part of what I'm doing. I want to compare this old stove to the new one that I'm getting, which is not induction. It's just a standard glass ceramic cooktop. The CO2 monitor has not registered a change yet, and I should have noted I have disabled the building HVAC, so nothing should run, nothing should move air around throughout this test except for the extractor. And again, the CO2 meter is from where I am right now, about 30 feet going around a corner away from the stove, so about nine meters or so. Oh, you can see my feet, how good. I just checked the CO2 meter and it is reading 845 and it is rising. When I first walked over there, it was 843. So we are already up 30 some parts per million. I'm not quite 30. I good at math. As we approach the 10 minute mark, I'll go ahead and take another look at the meter. All right, it has registered a significant jump. It is now reading 960 parts per million. Now, some of that is because every time I walk over to it, I'm carrying some air from the kitchen over into the living room, but uh, that's a lot for how far away the meter is from the kitchen. If I brought it in here, I would imagine it would register probably 15, 1600 parts per million. But I don't want to do that because I, I want to illustrate that. Even with the extractor running, and I know this isn't a very good one, but indoor CO2 levels are going very much out. They're becoming a lot, words, words. Indoor CO2 levels are very elevated from using just this one burner for 10 minutes. And the water's not even to a boil yet. Okay, so from the first test, we should be getting near proper boiling, and you can probably see some bubbling happening. My, uh, when exactly you reach boiling is of course gonna be a little subjective. My, what I'm looking out for is the surface of the water to be very disturbed. So right now, definitely not boiling, uh, but I will stop the timer once I see it boiling. In fact, I'll reposition myself, get closer to it. It's right on the edge of where I would call it boiling. Yeah, 
I'll stop it here. So this pot took 17 seconds longer than the other one, uh, proving once again that energy is energy and water is water. Now this is actually, I want to point this out because you may have noticed that there wasn't any visible steam until I turned off the burner. Let me tilt the camera up a little bit. When I turn the burner back on, see how the steam disappears? That's because there's so much exhaust going around the pot. The exhaust gases from the burner are so hot that they're able to keep the, the water vapor that's escaping from condensing into mist so it's visible as steam. The amount of energy that gets wasted from a gas stove by the exhaust just going around the pot is tremendous. And you'll see as, again, as soon as I turn the burner off, now there's visible steam. These aren't the best things in the world. I don't think so anyway. Oh, let me check the CO2 meter. It read 1160, come with me. There we go. Man, you can hardly read that. Can I make the light go on? It's got a light. Guess that doesn't do what I thought it was gonna do. Now, it's gonna keep rising for a while, even though I've got the vent going on. Some of it, I'm near to it. If I'm talking at the camera, it will pick up my uh, exhalation. But yeah, I know I didn't show it to you when I started, but 818 is what we started at. And just using that one burner for 17 minutes or so, elevated it this much. I'll let the camera roll for a little bit and walk away from here. You can still read that, right? Okay, 1205. As you can see, it is still rising. 12.35. Yeah, so it's not just me being here. 45. As the air mixes around, it is, uh, it's, it's getting more concentrated. Oh, hey, look, it's a new stove. This is a standard glass ceramic cooktop. This is not induction. This is your old school, it just gets really hot stove. Why don't we do another comparison? I'm actually gonna do two at the same time here. So we have the eight quarts in this big pot and, uh, sorry, four quarts in this big pot, which is close to four liters, and then eight cups in this smaller pot. Pretty straightforward, we're just gonna do this again. Not gonna be able to start them at exactly the, I'll start them then hit the stopwatch, how about that? And I also gotta make sure I do the right size burners because we got different options here Okay, that's close enough. I have a higher angle so you can see more betterly. Um, this is a higher power burner than the one on the left. Um, if the whole burner were in use, they would be equally powered, but the one on the left is probably running at about two kilowatts. And it is not ideal for this pot. Uh, hopefully the pot would be better if it were a little bit bigger, but we're just gonna leave it as it is. And for this test, I'm not even gonna bother turning on the extractor fan because you know what? We're just boiling water. That's all we're doing. And we're not gonna be generating any smoke or particulates or anything like that. And as a matter of fact, I've done a bunch of testing already and it is delightful how indoor CO2 has not gone up at all. So the time we have to beat is 16 minutes and 47 seconds for this which I've already done a test, we are not gonna beat that. We might, but we're gonna get close. What's gonna happen is fairly soon, this burner is gonna shut off because of a high temperature limit. Um, it's a drawback of this particular stove. My understanding is it's fairly common these days that they can only run at full power for some set period of time and then a limit kicks in. That burner though will probably not do that because it's, it's running at a lower power setting and it's more spread out. Also, just interesting note, these look more pink on camera, there that one went, um, because of the huge amounts of infrared that they are putting out. To the naked eye, they look a very dark red. Oh, and then the time to beat for that one is actually 19 minutes. It took 19 minutes for the old stove's normal burner to bring it to a boil. 
So if this gets us there before 19 minutes, then it did it faster. Now while we are waiting, spoiler alert, even the small burners in the back, the one that my phone is on right now is a warming burner, so it's not a true burner. Even the small burners at the back are faster at boiling quantities of water like this than the normal burner on my gas stove. This is exciting, isn't it? As we approach the seven minute mark, we're probably going to start seeing steam appear over at least one of these two. This is actually something about gas stoves that I had never really appreciated is problematic, I guess you could say. The volume of those exhaust gases going around the pot, in addition to masking the steam like I showed earlier, they make just stirring things or smelling things. It's much more difficult to interact with the items on the stove because you have this blast of hot air coming up from the stove no matter what. Whereas these, because we do have a lot of infrared light, especially since these pots are a little bit smaller than the elements, so you do feel some warmth coming off of these, but I can put my hand here comfortably, even here over the, over the burner. You can't really do that with a gas stove that's lit high. You need a longer spoon, like a wooden spoon or something, to stir comfortably, at least in my experience. And yes, I can see yeah, you can see the wisps of steam starting to come up from there. You would not see that at all on the gas stove uh, because of all those exhaust gases. Is it helpful for boiling water? Probably not. But I would argue that for cooking some other things, having a visual indicator of steam is helpful. <laughs> I didn't think that was going to be a problem. Let me move it farther away. Let's move that bottle out of the way. Oh no! <laughs> well... Hey, hey, we didn't lose it. I'll just keep the phone away from here. So, we are very nearly approaching boiling on this one at the 14 minute mark. Okay, folks, I'm gonna call that boiling. We're at 14 minutes, 45 seconds. I'm gonna shut it off because uh, the phones are not happy. So 14 minutes, 40, I should have hit lap, shouldn't I? We'll just do that. So 14.45 is where we were. We'll say 15 minutes, we can just round it to that. That is still four minutes faster than the normal burner on my gas stove. Now, in order for this to tie the gas stove, it needs to get to a roaring boil within the next minute, which I wouldn't say is likely. At this point, the gas stove had it boiling, but as you can see, we are really close. And remember, that burner was the really high-powered one where the flames lick up the sides. That's the only burner on that stove that could do this. I'm just about getting those big disturbances that I count as boiling. I bet the next time the element pops on we'll be there.
Yeah, I'm calling it. Maybe should have called that earlier. But less than a two minute penalty on this stove to bring quite a lot of water to boil on a burner which isn't even sized ideally for that pot and which is power limiting itself. Electric stoves are not slow, folks. Okay, and now for funsies, I'm gonna test the tea kettle again, but this time on the more moderate burner. Uh, my original testing, I, I'd have to go look at the video to see exactly what it did, but I know that this burner right here, it's what I, it's the only what I call normal burner, but this one is actually only a little bit more powerful than this one. Uh, but anyway, so I'm gonna give it that advantage this time around, and let's bring the CO2 meter into the kitchen so we can see exactly what's happening in this room. So, I'm gonna pour in one of these bottles worth of water. This is extremely close to one liter. Probably a tad more than. I'll do the same amount later when this stove is out of here. Okay. Uh, where's the lid? There it is. And in this case, we can have a more objective. When it starts whistling, it's boiling. Just gonna turn the whistle so it's not pointing right at my phone. Trying to center that reasonably well. Okay, and I will turn on the extractor fan again, giving us all the advantages we can get for the CO2. It is on its high speed, by the way, and let's go. I'm actually very curious to see what the CO2 meter does because I have not done this before. Oh, and also this burner is more directly underneath the microwave, so it should do a better job at extracting but I, I uh, don't have a lot of faith that it will. Okay, I first heard the whistle. So now, obviously, I wanna see what happens when I turn off the extractor. Yeah, I know, you, sh you shouldn't do that. It's a bad idea to leave an open flame without some sort of ventilation. Well, we know our t while, while I write down the times for these tests, you keep watching that meter. And actually, I'm gonna walk, I'm just gonna walk back, back and forth a couple times to move the air a little bit. Okay, now it's rising. This may just have more of a delay than I was expecting. Okay, some minutes later and it's leveled out at 1220 and the temperature is more in line with what it actually is in here, so I don't know. I really don't know. Um, but definitely it was at about 8, was 818 when I started this test sitting over here, so... Um, I guess that back left burner, the uh, extractor fan is actually getting the majority of the exhaust out, but certainly the front right, which it makes sense is not even underneath the microwave, the front burners aren't, uh, that really adds to indoor CO2 levels. So um, anyway, this video is, I'm certain, all over the place, unless I really edit it down, but this is just for Conextras, so you know, it's allowed to be all over the place. I make the rules. How about we get even more all over the place? So editing me realized that talking head me forgot to tell you that after I did these tests, uh, I did them before I made dinner that evening, and after making dinner, which required using the oven and I believe one of the burners on the stove, though I don't remember for sure, whatever I did ended up peaking indoor CO2 at 1560. That is like just holy yikes that's pretty much double the typical baseline level now granted that was after the test that i did but still that just goes to show you how high it can go and i can tell you from experience um previously just making a typical meal i would easily get above 13 1400 especially whenever i used the oven 
And after a solid hour of leaving the extractor fan on and the two bathroom fans, we got down to 1110 parts per million, which honestly is a better showing than I was expecting. But still, that is still pretty elevated even after an hour of all those fans running. So really, if I wanted to get CO2 levels down, I would have to just open a window for a while and then heat the air back up. So yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty bad. Okay, one final test of the kettle uh, on this three zone burner. We'll do the medium setting. And one thing that I should stress, I have been starting all these tests with the burners cold. This time I will prove it to you by touching the stove. It's stone cold. Uh, the hot surface indicator light is not on. Anyway, let's get to it. Actually, since I just touched that with my oily hands before we start, I'm gonna clean that off. Number one rule with this type of stove top is keep it clean. If you let oily residue get on the burners and then turn them on, you will regret that. So normally I'm just using glass cleaner day to day. Really, I use glass cleaner for practically everything, but uh, there are specific cleaners like Ceramic Bright for a cooktop like this. Our one liter test volume, or close to it anyway, the same bottle. And remember, I'm considering it done in the kettle the moment I hear a peep from the whistle. Maybe add like one second to the time. So I've opted to use the middle burner because the six inch intersection is a little bit smaller than the kettle's bottom. And so most of the middle section is just going around the kettle, although the sides, eh, it is actually about the same diameter as the kettle itself. But of course, most of that heat energy is just being reflected into the kettle. So some's making it in, but most is just going up top. And uh, I can feel the heat from the burner, although honestly, less than I would have imagined. So anyway, now we wait. Seven fifteen. All right. Okay, so now that you've seen the tests that I actually recorded for the camera, I did several other tests off screen, and I want to run over the results with you now. Um, unrelated to the stove top, this is just interesting to note. The gas range took eight minutes and 59 seconds, so nine minutes, to preheat to 400 degrees. This new range, and I'm surprised it took this long to think of this strategy. My, uh, the one thing about electric ranges or ovens that I've thought was a disadvantage to gas is they tend to be slower to preheat. Uh, at least that's been my experience. My mom and dad have a wall oven because they have a separate cooktop to cook top. And that thing, is, it takes a while to preheat. I've never timed it, but it feels quite slow. So the old range was about nine minutes to get to 400. This new thing, both of the ovens 
heat to 400 in under eight minutes. Because what they're doing is they're using both the broil heating element and the main heating element to preheat. It's called rapid preheat on this particular model, which seems so obvious. I don't know why, I mean, maybe that's been standard for a while, but now that what I thought was an advantage of a gas oven, also gone. Electric ovens are faster to preheat, at least these days. Maybe it's a tie for some models, but certainly that's not a disadvantage anymore. So moving away from the oven, let's go back to the cooktop. So remember the big Ikea pot with four quarts, one gallon, close to four liters of water in it was the only thing that the new stove did not beat the old stove on. Old stove did 16 minutes, 47 seconds. The best time on the new stove was 18 minutes. So really it's a small disadvantage, but it was there. Everything else the electric stove is doing more quickly than the gas stove. And also important to remember is that only that one quick boil burner that produces massive flames managed to beat the time. I also put that pot with four quarts of water in it over the back left burner. And on that particular stove, it took 35 minutes to boil. So huge loss there. Uh, the smaller pots with eight cups of water in there, on the front left normal burner, it took 19 minutes. So just about 20 minutes to get eight cups of water to boil. On the new stove, even in the back burners, the smallest ones, eight cups of water took uh, 16 minutes and 45 seconds. The smallest burner on this gas or electric stove, the smallest burner, which is only 1200 watts of output, beat by two minutes and 15 seconds, the normal gas burner on the gas stove. Thinking back to the stove that I grew up with, that thing just had four identical burners. And I don't know what the output was, but given judging by the size of the uh, flames, very similar to that stove. So I, that blew my mind more than anything. The slowest burner on this electric stove is faster than what I would call a normal burner on a gas stove. That same pot moved to the front left burner set to the medium setting. It reduced down to 14 minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, the best was the best time. I also had a 15 minute run for that same thing. Uh, and then unrelated to comparing to the gas stove, but I do just want to point out that weird power limiting thing that I mentioned the stove is doing. The back left burner by numbers is actually 100 watts more powerful than the back right. However, it restricts itself more severely. So doing a race with two very similar pots from Ikea, uh, 15 minutes on the back left and 13 minutes on the back right. So in effect, the back right burner is a bit faster just because that power limiting thing doesn't kick in quite so early. Um, and I should note, I suspect the reason why it's doing that is it's a crude way to prevent the stove from tripping a circuit breaker. I don't think it's actually necessary for the function of the cooktop. Uh, my mom and dad's cooktop, I'm pretty certain does not do that. The burners only ever cycle on and off when you have them set to something other than high. Um, but if you add up the wattage of the burners on this stove, it's 3000, 3000, 1300 and 1200. So that's six and 2500. So that is 8,500 watts just from the burners up top. And on a 50 amp breaker, the most you can pull is 12 kilowatts. So if you had all four burners running and both ovens on, I think this stove would actually pull more than 50 amps. So I suspect the main reason it has this feature is to basically keep you from overloading the circuit for more than a few minutes at a time. But that might not be the case. It may just be that a built-in oven, the cooktop can't get so hot. I don't really know. I, this is the first stove range with oven and stove that I've lived with. I've used them before in like hotels, extended stay hotels, but I've never actually lived with one until now. So I don't know exactly why it's doing that, but in the end, it doesn't matter because even with that power limitation, which cuts the 3000 watt output of the biggest burner down to effectively 2000 watts, it's still 
almost as fast as the giant burner on the gas stove and faster than any other situation that I can test with the gas stove. So just by numbers, the electric stove, the bog standard electric stove is faster than the gas stove. So then, now for some speculation. Why does it feel slower than the gas stove? Because I will be honest, even to me, when you turn on the electric stove, it feels like, oh, this is gonna take forever. I now think this is largely psychological because when you turn on a gas stove, you know, it's the tick, 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 foof, and you get a flame and you can see and hear that flame. Whereas an electric stove, a conventional stove, and induction as well, but more electric, you turn it on, you hear a faint humming, and then nothing appears to happen. The newer radiant stoves, you know, you get the glow within a few seconds, and then it's pumping out as much heat as it ever will, but there's no noise, there's no visible flame, it just seems like nothing's happening. And so I think this is largely a psychological thing that still affects me, whereas you, you turn on that stove and you feel like nothing's happening. But in actuality, once you let that thing get warm, it's gonna heat faster than any gas, well, most gas stoves uh, in most situations. Right, the kettle, forgot about the kettle. Uh, so this kettle on the back burners is slower than on the gas stove. The back burners, the times were 10.54 on back left and 10 minutes and seven seconds on back right. Uh, the old stove managed to get it in eight minutes on the back left. It would have taken a little bit longer, I think, on the front left burner. Uh, I could go back to my kettle script because I timed it then. I think it was around, I think it was less than eight minutes. So it's probably a little bit longer because the water was colder because it's winter time now rather than, uh, was that summer or still spring? Whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, however, the new stove with the uh, front left burner on the medium setting, it got the kettle to a boil in seven minutes and 15 seconds. So it is still faster than the, ga than the gas stove, at least on that one burner. However, the uh, mega burner, I didn't test it. However, I do know all over the place. In the past, if I had used that burner with the kettle, I never timed it, but I have done in the past, the handle would be too hot to touch from all the heat going around the kettle, making it to the top. So I never used that burner. And then of course I got an electric kettle because there's no reason to boil water in a kettle on a stove. Electric kettle remains faster than this stove, no matter what, just because there's losses involved with transferring heat from the burner to the kettle to the water. We've been over that. Okay, so now that we've gone through all that testing, I want to talk about some of the other advantages of an electric stove, as well as the big disadvantage that I'm sure lots of you have been yelling at your screen for a long time. Uh, I want to preface this with two things, however. First, I am not that culinarily adventurous. I will just put that out on the line. The most complicated thing I do with my stove or cooktop is stir fry things like vegetables or um, making some sort of a stir fry dish. For the most part, uh, I rarely go out to eat, but I buy a lot of stuff from Trader Joe's, which is basically mostly pre-prepared. I don't do a lot of cooking from scratch. So take what I'm about to say with a massive grain of salt if you are someone who really enjoys cooking from scratch, the, that sort of thing. It's not my bag, but more power to you if you like that. But the other thing that I wanna say before we get into this is, only 38% of homes in the US have a gas stove. The majority of American homes have electric stoves. And because induction cooktops have barely penetrated this market, probably 58% of homes have a traditional electric stove. So for the majority of us here, we are living with this type of stove day to day. Most people know how to use them for most culinary purposes. There are some that definitely they have huge disadvantages for, but it is a majority of Americans that are using conventional electric cooktops. So for those that are worried about how awful it would be to live with one, most of us are already doing it and we are fine. But with that out of the way, here's the big disadvantage, which 
I'm sure most people are aware of, and that is thermal inertia. This is probably the big reason why it feels like electric stoves are slower than gas stoves, and it is the reason why they are slower to react. That is the thing. You have to plan for what the stove is going to do when you are cooking, because a gas stove can go from zero to 100% to zero instantly. Its heat output is completely uh, modulatable. Is that a word? Modulatable? Sure. And you have fine control over the whole range and it reacts instantly. I will, however, say I have never used a gas stove where the knob has a linear uh, rate of change to the flame size. It's usually quite stepped, so I usually have to watch the flame to see what it's doing to judge how I've actually changed the heat output, but anyway. An electric stove, because you have the thermal mass of either the heating element or the glass ceramic cooktop, um, and I actually think a regular coil top stove might be a little bit better in this regard, but it's been too long since I've used one, and the little cheap ones you can buy that plug into the wall, they don't have proper um, duty cycle controls, at least from what I have experienced. So I can't say that for certain, but in any case, there's, a, there's the thermal mass of the heating element itself, which has to be overcome when you are increasing temperature, and then hangs out there when you're decreasing temperature. So rather than that very square graph you can have of heat output with a gas stove, a conventional electric, you turn it to high, and it's gonna slowly start climbing in temperature, and then the thing that people find really difficult to deal with is when you switch it to low, it's going to still keep rising for a while and then level out and start falling. It's probably parabolic, like most things seem to be in nature. For certain culinary uh, techniques and or certain brains, this is very difficult. For me, it's not. This is just something that I know is going to happen. And uh, I think I already said it, but I've been taking so many takes of this I may have forgotten. I just know that when I'm bring in something to a boil that I then need to simmer, you need to turn the heat down before it gets to a boil. You need to look for the early signs of boiling, then turn it down, and you'll be fine. But I understand that other people have brains that are built differently, and that is really hard to manage. So I don't want to be dismissive of those folks, but I do strongly believe that that thermal inertia is something you can learn to deal with. And the other thing, which I feel like is obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway, if you have something on an electric stove that is about to boil over or is getting too hot and you need to get heat away from it, pick it up. That's all you have to do. Just pick it up. Once it's not in contact with the stove surface, heat will stop going into it instantly. But if you ever need to remove the heat from something, just pick it up. It doesn't even need to come up more than a couple inches. It's going to stop boiling. So again, I've turned it off. It's still hot enough to make this boil, but pick it up. You always have that option. And you can just put it right next to where you need it or put a hot pad on the counter. I realize that's not perfect. I'm not trying to sell you on, ooh, amazing. Just, you can always do that. If something's about to boil over, pick it up. Is that as elegant as just turning it down? No but you can just pick it up and it's gonna solve that problem for you. Yes, you're gonna need place to put it or just hold it in the air, I guess. So it's not perfect, but that option is there. You can take it, I have used it, you will be fine. However, some people find that thermal mass helpful. I can't say that I do, but as a matter of fact, it is helpful to how the stoves modulate their power because they're duty cycle based. So when you set it to full power, it just stays on. If you have it to 90%, it'll be on for maybe 30 seconds and off for three seconds and then turn back on. Uh, so you, if the control is, is uh, good enough, you can have a very linear reaction on the dial, but it is going to be slow because you have to deal with the thermal mass. But anyway, you know, if it were that instant reaction like gas, that would be awful if you just turn the burner on high for 30 seconds, then turn it off for 15 seconds, 
you're, you basically don't have any heat control. But because you got that big thermal mass of an electric stove, yeah, it's probably doing a little bit of rippling as you go, but you can, like I've heard people say they can't get a simmer on an electric stove. I can. I don't know if we have very different definitions of simmer, but um, I can. That's like I said, you turn it to, like for making cream of wheat, turn it to high, start to see, oh, I'm getting bubbles around the edges, go down to like three, and then what do you know? It comes to a boil and then start simmering. So I don't really understand that particular complaint, but I'm to reiterate, it is a thing. It's a thing you have to learn how to deal with. Some people may not be able to learn how to deal with it and certain cooking styles flat out will not work with it, uh, which I don't want to dismiss as not important, especially if it's a cultural thing. Uh, the one thing that keeps coming up when I have discussions online is cooking with a wok. Uh, there are now induction woks which exist, but they're very expensive and most conventional electric ranges just do not work well with a wok. Um, I've never really used a wok. I don't know how to use one properly, so that is not a thing that I'm aware of, but I'm not going to... I mean, I trust that that is a thing. All right, I almost forgot this advantage of a gas stove and people would be really mad if I didn't bring it up. And that is, they work during power outages. And uh, in my past, in my childhood, that is a thing that we did a few times, just light them with a match and it works. However, I'm not sure how many new stoves will work without power. I have experienced a couple, my brother had one, that if they had a power, a brief power interruption, it would then say, verify all uh, burners are off and then press start. It had a safety valve which would kill gas to the burners. And I don't know if that would, like, I don't know if that valve is normally open and it closes when it has power or what. It might not work without power. I don't know. I'd have to see if I can arrange to try that. But assuming a regular stove, you can use it during a power outage, which I will grant you is a cool advantage and it might be important depending on where you live. However, two things. Uh, if that's something you absolutely want to have, you can get a camping stove for emergencies. I would probably recommend like a little propane powered one with the little bottles. Uh, or if you have some sort of backup power solution, you can get a portable plug-in burner. Uh, induction or otherwise. So for me at this point, I am beyond that being important because I have other ways to cook should I need that. Um, and actually to plug the really cool thing that electricity lets us do, because of my new car and the vehicle to load adapter, like I'm not gonna ever have a generator because so long as my car has some useful charge, I can just plug a little burner into it plug the microwave into it, uh, the fridge, freezer, whatever I need to, and use my car for that purpose. But anyway, I did just want to not forget, that's a cool thing if you are prone to power outages and you still want to be able to cook on your stove. A gas stove lets you do that. But personally, I wouldn't cling to that because you can get a camping stove if you really want to, or some sort of a battery backup solution, or a generator. There's lots of other options besides just that. So I wouldn't put too much weight on it, but I will admit, it's cool and useful. But now let's talk about the advantages because this is the other reason why I decided, yeah, let's just get rid of the gas stove. So after all the testing that I've done, guess what indoor CO2 levels did? They stayed flat because there's nothing emitting CO2 in the building other than me. The furnace is properly vented outside. So even when it runs for two hours, indoor CO2 does not change. Now, not worried about that at all that source of air pollution is gone. But other than that, let's talk about more quality of life things. Heat in the kitchen. In the summertime, cooking with a gas stove or especially using a gas oven sucks. It just sucks. I have never changed my opinion on that because it produces quite a lot of heat. I'm gonna show you this clip from the kettle video. This is the tea kettle on top of the gas stove in the thermal camera you can see that so much energy is just going around the pot. That little 9,000 uh, BTU burner is something like three kilowatts of heat. That is the most powerful burner on the electric stove. So the most powerful burner on the electric stove can only produce as much heat as a fairly weak burner on the gas stove. 
Gas stoves are just so bad at getting the heat energy from the fuel they combust into the cookware that a lot of it goes around the cookware, ends up in your home, and in the summer, that sucks. The oven is particularly egregious in my experience because gas ovens have to vent their exhaust out. So usually it's underneath the control panel, if you feel back there. Um, there's a lot of hot air or hot gases coming out of that spot whenever the oven burner is on because it has it's combusting fuel. It has to get that exhaust out of there. That adds heat to your kitchen in addition to the actual heat of the oven cavity. Whereas electric ovens, they can actually be insulated because the electric heating element doesn't need to be vented. So you preheat an electric oven, it doesn't heat up the kitchen nearly as much as a gas oven. And I actually think it might even do less than a toaster oven, but I haven't done much comparison on that. So cooking in the summer with any electric range, induction or not, is so much nicer. Next thing related to that, go back to the clip on the heat going around the tea kettle. I have this pot here because these cheap uh, saucepans I use quite a lot. Um, and they, they're from Walmart. They're not the greatest quality. However, if you look at this handle, it has this lovely design quirk where it will collect exhaust gases from the stove and then they'll travel up the handle. So when you use these pots on a gas range, this gets too hot to touch virtually any, anything you're doing. Uh, even just using that little simmer burner to heat up like uh, some baked beans, you cannot touch this with bare hands. You need a, uh, something like an oven mitt to use it to actually hold it. That never happens with an electric stove. And it's not just this pot. I have plenty of cookware that on the gas stove, uh, including a nice, it's not quite a wok, but a rounded frying pan type thing that I cannot use with bare hands. Also related to that, and again, this is one of those brain nuggets that once it gets in your brain, you're like, wow, why do I want this? Uh, let's go back to the cooking cream of wheat example. You have to stir that constantly while it's simmering. On a gas stove, if you, I just stir it with the spoon I'm gonna eat it with because why make two things dirty? When you are stirring with something like a spoon, it hurts because all those gases going around the pot are searing your hand a little bit. That's just a thing that I've been used to and figured, well, that's a consequence of cooking. That doesn't happen with an electric stove. Even if the pot is a small one, you just use the small burners. You might feel a little bit of heat coming around the pot, but mostly it's nowhere near as hot as stirring anything with a gas stove. Also, more uh, complicated things cooking on the gas stove. Say you, you have your face near the, the a frying pan, something like that. Tons of exhaust gases are shooting up around the pan and going into your face, which makes it hard and I mentioned this online and people thought I was nuts, but to me, that makes it hard to smell what's cooking because you have this volume of hot air coming at you and it's uh, dispersing the actual odors from the food, scents, whatever. Uh, and it just, in addition to making it more uncomfortable, it's harder to see how the food or harder to experience how the food is cooking. Also, this is from, if I didn't already show you, I'm gonna hammer this point in, or I'll go back to it now. With a gas stove, you cannot see water vapor coming up from water as it gets close to a boil. All those exhaust gases going around the pot prevent the water vapor from condensing and turning into visible steam. Whereas on an electric stove, because you don't have that huge amount of gas going around the pot, you can see that. So you also have better visual indicator of how well your food is cooking. The whole heat going around the pot thing is a huge disadvantage that I had never really considered until I bothered cooking on my parents' stove again and realized this is actually quite nice. So those are my main advantages as far as cooking from on the electric stove perspective. Handles don't get hot. You don't have a bunch of gas coming to you. You can see things when they're about to boil. It's easier to smell things. You can get your face up nice and close into whatever you're cooking without singeing your hair. Also, there's no open flames. That's plus two. You don't have to worry about your hair catching on fire. So there are a lot of advantages that I, for me, outweigh the disadvantage of the thermal inertia thing. I have been completely disillusioned from gas stoves as being 
so much better. Uh, and then another thing I didn't even mention was the noise. Uh, the noise from the burners, this is a small thing, but like on an electric stove, the noise is the food cooking. So if you start to hear some boiling sounds or the searing, the sizzling, that's all you hear. Whereas with the gas stove, you also have to deal with the noise of the flame. The reason why I don't think this is a big deal is because that noise is also a good indicator of the heat output. So I'll call that a wash. But aside from cooking, there are some other advantages as well. You know what's really cool about a conventional radiant cooktop? It's a big flat surface. And when you're not using it to cook, you can use it as a work surface for something else. Same goes for induction stoves. I've never had a gas stove, which isn't either the old fashioned kind that has the little individual burner things or just a big grate on top. They get discolored over time. They're hard to clean. It's just a pain to live with. And you can't set things on them that you can with an electric stove because it's just a big slab of glass or whatever the material is on induction stoves. Another big advantage, and I, not to mention easy to clean, uh, a radiant cooktop, a lot of people complain about them because you know they do get extremely hot. And if you do not clean them regularly, uh, you can get oils that kind of smear onto the surface. They get discolored. But if you clean them regularly, it's not a big problem. Thinking back to my mom and dad's stove, they use Ceramabrite on it regularly. It looks perfect even though it's 15 years old at this point. Uh, the only, literally the only cosmetic defect is it has a big scratch on it now that showed up like a year or two ago according to them. So, I don't know. To me, that doesn't seem like a big deal. I think people just, like the biggest thing is if you cook something that is splattering oil, you need to clean the cooktop before you use it again, because if you trap that oil underneath the pot and then turn it on, it will leave a mark. So that's the big thing. But you can get that out just by buffing. I don't think it's that big of a deal. Uh, so yeah, food for thought, right? Now, final discussion after all this rambly nonsense. So I kind of talked about it before. Why didn't I get an induction range? Why did I just get a conventional radiant cooktop? Uh, mainly, I'm a tortured Midwesterner who doesn't need the best of the best and is allergic to spending a lot of money on something like a basic kitchen appliance. However, I did want that double oven thing. So to get that with an induction cooktop was something like $3,000. Whereas getting without with a radiant cooktop was about fourteen hundred. I something about spending double the money just to get an induction cooktop didn't sit right with me, and the only option that I could get quickly uh, was a Samsung model that they have a weird door situation for their double oven model. So just was not a priority to me. But there's two other there's three other reasons. Um, for one thing. Again, I don't find cooking with a regular electric stove to be all that difficult. So the advantage of induction is not something that I that I truly feel like I need. But secondly, I have quite a lot of cookware that doesn't work with induction. Um, I do have an individual induction cooktop. I've tested it. And basically, I have a set of IKEA cookware, one other thing, and this tea kettle. And that's it. These saucepans don't work. I have a couple of skillets I use that don't work. I have a vegetable steamer that doesn't work. Um, it, it's one of the downsides of the fact that in the US induction is just barely moving here. There's a lot of cookware for sale that does not work with it. And then the other thing is the cookware that I do have is very loud and it makes an unpleasant noise on induction cooktops. And I now know it's not just the one that I played with. It is better with a different cooktop, but it's still pretty loud. So it's a very unpleasant noise for me. I didn't want to deal with that. I'm sure there's better cookware that doesn't make that noise. Uh, the tea kettle is practically silent, but all of the cookware that I have has, um, the sides are not magnetic, but the bottom is, and probably the way the bottom is bonded to the pot, it's resonating in some way. It's loud. But here's the biggest reason why I didn't bother getting induction. These exist. So if for some reason I want the benefits of induction, I can just use this thing. And 
Going back to the flat work surface of the electric stove, so long as the stove isn't hot, I can just plop this on top of one of the burners and still use the vent hood that I currently have. So, and again, this is part of the, going back to these things are like 60 or $70. So the fact that it cost $1,500 more to get basically the same oven, but with an induction cooktop, I'm a Midwesterner. I can't justify that. That's awful. Plus, I will be honest, I have some reservations about how reliable induction cooktops might be. I know they've been around for a long time. They're probably pretty reliable, but I am concerned that if I lose a burner or there's some sort of uh, electronic fault in the stove that it's going to turn into a, a nightmare to fix. And the disadvantage of us all having stoves combined with ovens is if you have that problem, you might not need to spend more money than you would otherwise. So we basically don't have any cheap induction options here except plug-in burners. And since these exist and they are about as powerful as most induction ranges, well, I shouldn't say that. A lot of induction ranges do have crazy high power burners, but this thing, I timed that big pot of water to boil. It was about 19 minutes on an induction plug-in cooktop. So it's about as fast as the fastest burner on a radiant stove. Uh, so yeah, if I want that greater control, that instant on and off, I can have that in addition to the radiant cooktop. So that's why it wasn't a priority for me. These exist, they're plentiful. Uh, if I want to start playing around with more fancy cooking techniques, I can just get one of these. Um, but certainly if you are in the position to replace your stove and you want to go induction, you might consider it. For me, it's just not worth it yet. With all the cookware I have that doesn't work with it, the fact that conventional electric really doesn't bother me, the fact that some cookware I've used is really loud and unpleasant to use, and the fact that these things exist if I really want to go with it, I just couldn't justify the purchase. Anywho, I think that's all. This is a very long video and I can tell I had my coffee and I've been rambling really fast. So we'll see how y'all like this one. But uh, to reiterate, I'm not telling you you should hate your gas stove, but I am saying maybe it's worth being a little more critical of some of the disadvantages that right now you just accept as a fact of cooking life which don't have to be. Less heat in the kitchen, easier to touch cookware without needing a, an oven mitt, and easier to clean. There's a lot of advantages to even a conventional, cheap, radiant cooktop that might be worth losing the fine control of gas. And even if you want that, these are there for you. So I do think it's time we consider breaking up with our gas stoves, folks, because we have the technology.